We are so honored to have Muriel Winbeck Bank Hurl from England, who married Don Hurl, and Madge Darling McFadden from Scotland, who's married, who's married to Bill McFadden here. This is just the most amazing opportunity to get to speak to war brides. Uh, I can hardly wait for the evening to begin. Also, the Lakefield Historical Society is very interested in learning as much as we can about all of the war brides who settled in the Lakefield area. So we have started to list those that we've learned about, but would appreciate your help in collecting the names of any war brides from the Lakefield area that you know. So there'll be a sheet at the back of the room that you could add any information that you might have at the end of the evening uh, about war brides, that would be great. But let's just sit back and have a jolly good time. This is just going to be amazing. So I'll turn this over to Patricia Heffern and Frost Extraordinaire. <laughs> Oh, that's what happens when somebody short uses it first. <laughs> okay. You ladies look very calm, and I think if we did the hand test, mine would be the only one that was <laughs> jiggling tonight. Uh, I'm just going to open up here by setting the stage a little bit with um, uh, just an excerpt, a, a word of welcome. Uh, from a book that Muriel brought tonight, which you can see over here at the end of the evening. It was a book that was uh, written and given to uh, war brides coming from the British Isles. It was put out by the Department of National War Services, uh, by the Women's Voluntary Services Division. And I thought it was kind of a fitting way to open the evening. A word of welcome. The women of Canada have always been keenly interested in the activities of the women of the British Isles. Now that thousands of you, as wives of our sons and brothers, are coming from the old land to make your home in Canada, we are anxious to extend a welcome, a welcome that will express itself in many tangible forms. From the time you land on Canadian soil until you are settled in your new home, Canadian women will be ready to help you. You will find that every community has its volunteer committee to welcome you. And when you are settled, organizations clubs, church groups, etc., will in turn anticipate receiving help from you, realizing that you have had experiences which will enrich whatever group you join. A practical form of welcome to the Canadian way of life is this little book, which has been prepared in collaboration with the consumer sections of the Wartime Information Board and the Department of Agriculture. It is hoped you will find it a real help. Signed, Women's Voluntary Services Division, Department of National War Services. And it's over here, you might be interested in having a look. It has recipes and suggestions for different things they might start thinking about cooking when they get here. <laughs> so, uh, I think we'll start with you, Muriel. And if you wouldn't mind, just try to lean in a little bit to your mic so we can be sure that everybody can catch what you're saying. That'd be great, thank you. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong in any of this information, but I'll just open it up here by saying you were born in 1920 and you come from Lind Lindhurst, Hampshire, in England. Would you tell us a little bit about the Windebank family and about Lindhurst when you were growing up? What kind of... Uh... <laughs> okay, how about uh, just about the size of the town? I think you said it's comparable to Lakefield. About the same size as Lakefield. Yeah, and what kinds of things did you occupy yourselves with as children, maybe a little bit about your, your siblings. Oh, a lot of yeah. sleeping. Yeah, that yeah. kind of thing, yeah. And, uh, well, we didn't get out very far from the house when we were young. Right. We um, didn't get around the village much until we were going to school. Yeah. And uh, started school when I was five. Right. And I finished school when I was uh, 14, for two years in grade seven, because it was as far as our school went. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. No, yeah. no? Okay. Can we move the mic over? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Anything else in particular about your village that 
with it was about the same size as Lakefield, mm -hmm. and uh, there were um, two schools and two churches in the village. Okay, that's great. That's fine, thank right you. Right now, I can't think of yeah, anything. How many clubs, Mom? How many clubs? Seven. <laughs> 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 Are okay, thank you very much. Madge, you were born in 1928, is that correct? And. Uh, no, 27, sorry, 1927. Can you t tell us a little bit about the Darling family? Anything that comes to mind you think we might be interested in knowing? And Allenton is the name of the village you came from? Yeah. Was, it com was Allenton comparable to Lakefield in size? Uh, uh, she's got me beat. Her place was only half that size. Is that right? <laughs> there was only, what, four stores, wasn't it? About four stores, wasn't it? One school, one church. One up. <laughs> 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 okay. All right, Muriel, uh, you would have been about uh, about seventeen when the war began. Would that be about right? Nineteen. Nineteen. Okay. So tell us about your memories of that time. Rationing. Were there the bombings in London? Anything like that? Well, we weren't near London, we were near Southampton, and mm. they were bombed an awful lot. Yeah. Most of the, the town was bombed, and uh, of course there was big docks there. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> and I think you said Southampton was about eight, eight, eight miles, miles yeah. from where you lived? Yeah. You said, I think you recall you mentioning that there were bombs dropped and was it in your area there were in your seven hometown? bombs dropped right through our village and not one of them exploded or the whole village would have gone. <laughs> yeah. What about rationing? Was what were you, what are your recollections about that? I can't remember events, but I know we weren't allowed very much of anything. Mm -hmm. We used uh, uh, margarine and we got a small amount of margarine, a small amount of butter. My mother used to mix them all together. So we got the same thing. Right. And you mentioned uh, clothing as well. Uh, yeah, we yeah. had clothing rations. And uh, I can't remember again how much we could get. But uh, we had to buy shoes and uh, all our clothes, everything on that ration and materials. Right. Matched. What about you? Do you remember any similar experiences? Or it was much the same as what Muriel saying. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, my blanket. I don't know. Okay. Rationing of. Well, the rationing of the same. Yeah. But it was four ounces of margarine and two ounces of margarine. Oh, was it? Too long ago. I don't remember. <laughs> One time I went down to England with Bill and I got my rations and they fit it into a cigar box. Oh, and the curtains, you, if you've got a dress, you can get any else. Right? Yeah. 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 I bought a blanket and made a coat out of it. Because I don't think blankets were on ration, were they? No, I made a house coat out of it. I made a blanket. Yeah. <laughs> I made a coat out of a pretty green and when the bananas came into the village, there were so few of them came in that we were allowed half a banana each. Mm -hmm. And the family used to get together. together. <coughs> you remember that? No, I don't remember getting one. You <laughs> <laughs> must have got them in England. <laughs> Okay, Madge, I remember you mentioning something about the women's groups in your village. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Well, the, there was the women's group, and they used to have concerts and that, and there was soldiers billeted at a known distillery, and they used to invite them up for concerts. And that's how I ended up taking Bill home and leave to a concert. <laughs> <laughs> and I belonged to one of the concert parties. I used to sing it completely. Yes, I heard that. I heard that you have a beautiful singing voice. <laughs> yes, that's great. Um, and Muriel, we understand that you worked with 
wood on the ships. Well, worked in the the uh, factory, and it was not far from your home, was it? About 13 miles. About 13 miles. Can you tell us a little bit about that work? Well, we went into training at Marchwood Park. It was a big mansion made over, and uh, we had to stay there for two months. We could go home on the weekends, but we had to stay there at nights, and it was a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had an electrician's part, and a metal worker's part, and the woodworkers. That's mm -hmm. where I was. I remember your granddaughter Janine calling you Rosie the Riveter yeah. and to describe your work, although he said it was wood, and she claims that all the tools found in your home were yours and not, not actually your husband's all through the years. And Matt, you also, you worked as well before you came over to Canada. Yeah, but I worked in your ladies' department. Yes, so that's right. Oh. Yeah, I remember you mentioning that as well. Now, it must have taken an enormous amount of courage and planning and preparation to prepare for, for this big move. Now, how did you deal with that? And now, how did your family react when they realized that this would be taking place? Do you remember any of those kinds of things? No. Um, um, yeah. And, no, I really don't remember yeah. how it's going. Yeah. <laughs> Anything about your wedding plans and the wedding day? The only thing I remember my wedding day, it rained heaven so hard all day. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So how old were you when you met Bill? I was only, I was only 15 when I met Bill. 15, yeah. that's right. And you were married? Well, I was married the year after I was 17. Yeah, that's right. And then it would have been about two years later then when you came to Canada. Yeah. So you were 19 <laughs> years old, three years, yeah. yeah. Okay. Great, Muriel, how about you? Anything you'd like to say about uh, the planning and preparation for the wedding day and how that might be different? A lot of us in this room have never moved from one, you know, further than one side of the bridge to the other. <laughs> and, uh, it's a big enough job planning a wedding without, without having the uh, momentous... Well, we got engaged in March of 44. And uh, we were given permission to marry on July the 22nd or after, but not before, because he was a Canadian. And uh, he was gone from Lindhurst in May and went overseas. And he didn't come back until the um, 8th of February, he got into England the next year. And he came to Lindhurst on Friday, and we were married on Saturday. Oh. <laughs> we, had to, we had to go and get wedding ring and uh, permit the license and everything the day he got there. Yeah. <laughs> and I understand your best man didn't make it. He was coming. No, my uncle had to take him. He was coming from Canada, but didn't quite make the no, mark. No, he was coming from France. Oh, it was he? he okay. Came over from France, but he went in a different direction. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about you? Do you remember any sort of reaction from your family, your friends, even your own feelings about possibly leaving home and never returning? Well, he never asked me to marry him. He just said, do you want to go to Canada? <laughs> <laughs> some of the more practical arrangements. Can I, either of you shed some light on that? It probably would have been, you know, a lot of uh, dealings. Would there have been with the government, the, the British government the, in Scotland and the Canadian government for funding, paperwork, that kind of thing? Was it a bit of a trial or was, was it made very easy for you? You had to go and have uh, physicals before we yeah, had to right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And outside of that, there was no problem. Yeah. Okay, because both of you, yeah, great. And you were making the the trip alone. When you did make the trip, you were your husbands were here already. Yeah. And so was there a lot of letter writing going on back and forth to arrange or? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Have you got the letters? No. no. <laughs> <laughs>
What about the actual day, Madge, that you left? What are your memories of that day, and who who saw you off? And all the neighbors and my family all came to train with me. There was a lot of bawling. And... <laughs> yeah. yeah. What was the first leg of your journey like? You would have gone to a train station in your well, own. We went from Glasgow to Liverpool. Glasgow to Liverpool. And we were put in a bombed out school that part of it. And we were kept there overnight. And then we went to the boat the next day. And then the next day we sailed. Okay. Yeah. So about three days then leading yeah. up to the actual sailing. And Do you know, drink it What ship would you come over on? Who's asking me that? Leticia. Oh, Leticia. Leticia. Uh, any any encounters along the way, or interesting people that you met on the ship, or anything you'd like to share? Well, we were like a, we were bro, we were like troops, really. We were all familiar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we had sing songs, and we went to movies, and but the lights had to go out at a certain time at night, like they were. We didn't, it wasn't a, a vacation or anything, we mm -hmm. just made all the traffic, right? Yeah. And then we landed in Halifax and we looked after us there, and then we went to Montreal, and then we went to there to Belleville, <coughs> and then from Belleville up to Peru. Right. So, um, how long was the actual, were you on the ship for? How long were you on the ship for? Yeah, nine days. Nine days. And two days for Halifax mm -hmm. to Peru. Yeah. Did you fare well? Did it bother you to be in the ship for that long? Were you sick at all? No, I wasn't sick coming over. No, no. Oh, good. That's good. Lucky. It was when I got back, but it wasn't when I came over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Muriel? Do you remember that day clearly that you left home? And well, I lived eight miles one side of Southampton, and I had to go up to London and spend two nights and then come back to Southampton to get onto the Ile de France. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there were supposed to be 7,000 troops on her and 700 brides. <laughs> and when and my uh, friend, her husband was going to be on the same boat. <laughs> and when I went up the gangplank into the boat, we had to go up one at a time, get the sign in at the bottom and go up. And uh, we went into midships, and uh, when we, when I walked up there, my friend's husband yelled out, "Hey, bunny!" <laughs> <laughs> and from the top deck. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was my nickname. <laughs> All eyes were on you then, I'm sure. <laughs> Now what about, so the first, that's kind of the first leg then, what about any encounters along the way? And I know that uh, Mike Dean is here tonight, so he might like to, to well, join in this. that was when I came back the other time I met Mike. Oh right, that's yeah, right, I'd forgotten yeah. that, that was a different different one, we'll get to that a little bit later. Okay, um, you said the, the name of the ship that you were on was the, you just said? Old de France. Right, okay, and it would be, was it a nine day? Seven. Seven days. Okay. And you fared well on that journey? Did no, I didn't go to the dining room only the first night. I knew we were way down in and they were three bunks high in the park we were in. So I would head up onto the deck where the uh, soldiers were and uh, some of the girls would go up there and they brought us up crackers and stuff to eat. <laughs> <laughs> We used to have to line up to go for food. Oh, did you? Yeah, and you was lined up there, and some of them would be coming up the steps, throwing their oh, up. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, no. No. oh, no. We were all seasick. Oh, no. Good experience. <laughs> so, Madge, what was your first impression of Canada? That's a big question, I know. Yeah, mm. I don't know how to answer it. What about the I mean, landscape? It was beautiful yeah. in the morning. We came in, it was a lovely morning. And I can always remember the soil was red. Oh, yeah. I couldn't get over that. The soil in Halifax was all red. Mm -hmm. It was a lovely, calm morning. Yeah. And this would have been, just in case people didn't catch it, what, it would have been the month of May. May. Yeah. So, and it was only a couple months before March. March. Yeah. So it was March. Yeah. So you came yeah. and there was no snow. No. Muriel, you would have had a slightly different impression when you arrived. Well. It was snowing when we came into Halifax, 
Yeah. And uh, all the way along on the train, you see, we saw nothing but snow, and it looked like Christmas trees, <laughs> miles and miles <laughs> off. Yeah, yeah. And uh, every time we went through a little hamlet, I heard bells ringing, and I asked the fellow who was uh, getting off the train and getting anything we wanted and stopped. I said, do they have church on Saturday here? And he said, no, not that I know of. I said, well, there's a bell ringing every time we go through a little hamlet. <laughs> and he said, oh, that's a bell on the train. <laughs> <laughs> So we've gotten to Halifax. So from there, Madge, can you give us any any more detail, anything that comes to mind about the journey from there? No, we just put it was on a train mm -hmm. for Montreal. And we sat up all night, looked out the window like you did. <laughs> I didn't sit up all night. Oh, we, <laughs> we sat, my friend was, I was in the top bunk, she was in the bottom, so I came down the bottom and we just sat and looked out the window all night long. Mm -hmm. And then they took us to Montreal and put us on the train for Belleville. And then we got to Belleville, they took us in and they gave us, I guess it'd be breakfast where we get. And then they put us on the train for Peterborough. Mm -hmm. And then it, the minister came up and he said, is there something eating you? And I said, yeah. And my husband's meeting me and he said, no. He says, oh, you're, he asked me my name, and he says, oh, you're okay, they're going to meet you. But when I got to Peterborough, there was nobody to meet me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they thought I was coming on a Friday, and I came in on a Thursday. Oh, oh. oh. that would be a bit frightening. How did you It was. That? I wanted to go back home. <laughs> 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 that would be, it sounds like, uh, about a, a three-week journey then. Like, we're, we must be... Coming up on about three weeks there when you well, think about the nice day. Yeah. yeah. I arrived in the Victoria weekend I came here. Okay. Yeah, that's quite a journey. Okay, Muriel, anything after you arrived in Halifax from there on? Can you give us they some came idea? Right through to Toronto. Mm -hmm. I think they do anything else. Okay. To Toronto and then from there. Um, Harold Trude brought Don, uh, him and his wife brought Don and his mother up there to meet me. Okay. Yeah. Great. And I couldn't believe when we were driving from Toronto, there seemed to be absolutely nothing on the, <laughs> at the site. Hardly any houses those days. <laughs> I remember you mentioning, one of you mentioned even the stretch between Peterborough and Lakefield yeah, seemed so yeah. barren to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's changed a lot. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, so when you arrived in Lakefield, who who was here then? Was there? Did you just go to your husband's homes, parents' homes? I understand you both went to live with your husband's parents in their home, and so was there somebody waiting for you in the the village, or did you just make a quiet entrance and into your yeah? yeah. yeah. What about some of the, the daily, day-to-day -day differences you noticed um, between even the things that were in your homes at home and were not here, or vice versa? Things like running water, perhaps? <laughs> Was there? Yeah, yeah. 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 And they had to say toilets here, too. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first thing. That was the first thing that I noticed. I said to my husband, I have to go to the toilet, and he took me out onto the stoop and down into the shed and away down in the corner. And afterwards I said to him, you didn't tell me you didn't have any inside toilets. He said, you never asked me. What about the, the stoves and things like yeah, that? You missed the fireplace. Did you? I was scared to death of the big stove. Yeah, you come in and the, the, the stove looked like a radio or something. It was a new oil stove when I... Any other things around the house or in the village that, that immediately struck you as being different and something that would have to... I didn't like the lakes. 
I missed the seat. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 That didn't affect me. I wasn't going to get any more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they look pretty small, Muriel, wouldn't they? <laughs> well, they seem to be so still, they look deadly to me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Madge, you moved in with with the McFaddens, and um, so were, did you move in with just parents, or was there a large family? Well, no, well, Teresa and her husband were there. Right. I had a little sister, and mother and I, and mom and dad. Right. I was there for two years. Two years, and then you moved and to... And built that house, and I'm still in it. Yep, right, right up on the yeah. right. <laughs> St. Paul School there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and uh, in those days, you would be probably spending a lot of time with your new mother-in-law because in those days, mostly women were at home, and oh, yeah. Yeah, so that would be quite an adjustment, but it, you were quite young at that time as well, so... That, Childbred. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you want to tell us a little bit about um, what Bill's father did for a mm -hmm. living? Any of that about the McFadden's that you well, played to? He was a lot master. Yeah. He was a lot master. Mm -hmm. I think he was there for over 30, 34 or 35 years, I think. Yeah, a long time. He we was know. wounded in the First World War. Right. He walked with quite a bad luck. Right. I guess my dad will remember. Yeah. Would. Yeah. And Rena has done, your sister yeah. Rena is here tonight, and she's done a lot of research on the oh, yeah. McFadden's. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so anything you'd like to add here, Rena, we'd be. We know what they're related, mm -hmm. but um, we just kind of find that those grandfather went to. Right. And left here. And there is a link. We grew up thinking they were the only McFadden's in Lakeville. And the farms outside of, they're all related, it's all the same all family. The right. Yeah. It's okay, that's great. And they came in 1817. The McFadden's came in 1817. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and these other ones, the more the fight in the 1812 war. Then McFadden came back with a family. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll have you back for another night on the <laughs> Okay, Muriel, how about you? Can you give us a picture of, of what you were coming into, the Hurl family? Did you live with the parents, and yes. siblings, and... Yeah, just the parents. Just the parents. Okay, and you have an interesting story about uh, <laughs> your mother-in-law as well. Well, she didn't like me. <laughs> I think she had a picture up on the wall that you found kind of an... Oh, oh, oh you want me to tell yeah. me? <laughs> <laughs> She had a picture of my husband and his girlfriend. I'm not going to mention any names. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was right where you came in the front door. It was right on the wall in the front. And, uh, <laughs> His oldest sister said, I'd make mum take that down if I were you. I said, no, I just look at it. When I come in, I say, I got him, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Assuming again that you were probably spending a lot of time with your new mother-in-law and all those things. <laughs> I guess you managed well. She went back to work. She yeah. Oh, did she? Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else about that section of your life that I've kind of skimmed over that you'd like to? Well, I um, we moved up on to Catherine Street to where the Valances lived. We had a little bed sitting room up there. And then uh, when I was expecting John, the night I had to go to the hospital, uh, Ralph Hendren drove us in the taxi. And uh, it was so icy, we thought we were going to have to walk up the hill to the Nichols <laughs> Hospital. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, and then his mother talked us into going back there and living, because we had John then. And uh, we went back there. <coughs> Stay for ages. <laughs> 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 That's right. <laughs> 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 
Is the one just yeah. stopped by the canal? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a whole guy, whole guy yeah. lived there yeah. for many years, recently yeah. anyway. Yeah. Not a lot of people know that. And we moved, uh, we moved over to McDermott's, uh, the album McDermott's of McDermott. And that was right across from Lakeland in that big house that is a real estate man. We had an apartment upstairs there. And at Christmas, I got a picture in the mail from my uh, brother, his wife, and it was a picture of my little niece in the sand playing. And I said to my husband, that's where John should be. And he said, well, you're going home, you're homesick. And I was four and a half months pregnant when I went back to England and had Muriel. And then, so you stayed there. Don came with you and worked. No, he came over afterwards in okay. October. She was born in August, and he came over in October and worked for the Southern Electricity Board. And then he came back because his dad was very ill in March. And uh, we kept writing back and forth. And I was waiting for him to come back over because I didn't like it here. <laughs> <laughs> and he was waiting for me to come back. And finally, I stayed there two and a half years. <laughs> and finally, he wrote in 1951, he wrote and said, would you please come back over? So I said, well, book me a trip over in six months and I'll come so I can back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I would have done the same way, by the way. You've never dragged me away from home in the first place. So. <laughs> Great. Okay, Madge, what about that section? We covered what you'd like to talk about there, <clears throat> moving to Lakefield and in the big bodies. My family come over here. Yes. Like I didn't go back there. My family came over here. Right. Uh, my mother and my brother came first in what, 48? 48. And then Rena and my dad came in 49. Yeah. So we were all here. Yeah. That must have been very nice for, the, for well, you. Well, yes. Great to be homesick. Yes, I'm sure it did. <laughs> Okay, so what about um, what about your own your own children and, and here? Can you tell us then how your families developed and I have three here. Half of them is over there. Yeah. Belly's in bed sleeping because he's got a big shop and he goes to bed at seven. So. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I have seven grandchildren and nine great grandchildren. Wow. Very mm -hmm. nice. That's great. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Muriel? Yeah, I have six children. I have thirteen grandchildren and ten great grandchildren. Oh, and two more great grandchildren expected this year. Wow, that's great. So does that thirteen include there's a new one that was just born two weeks ago? Your granddaughter yeah, Jean? Great grandchildren, yes, Great right, right, yes. Ten, yeah. ten, yes, that's yeah. right. So that that the Jane. new baby, William Roy, born just on the just two weeks ago now. Yeah. The, yeah. So congratulations on <laughs> a new one. Okay, so what about your your husband's work? Can you tell us a little bit about that, man? I worked at the GE until he retired. At the GE yeah. until he retired. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and Muriel? Wire department. Wire department, you yeah. said. John worked at CG. Yeah. He was working for Warren Payne when I came out first at Grocers. Okay. And uh, he got into CG. And he worked as a crane hitcher. Crane hitcher. You ask about um, the parents. Don's dad worked at the Grove as a night watchman. Oh, is that right? Years, yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. All right, so um, you made that trip home. Can we go back to that for a minute, Muriel? Because uh, we'll get back to uh, Mike Dean. I think there's a connection there. If you want to, maybe Mike would like to come up and share, stand up and share that story from his perspective. I think you. Where is he? He's here.
trying to figure out how I met Muriel on the phone. Well, your friend that you came out to, or your sister's friend that you came out to, used to go to bingo, and so did my mother-in-law. And uh, they were talking about us coming over, and they decided we were on the same boat. Boat, yeah. And that's so I first met you. Yeah. You came down to my cabin, and we were all set. <laughs> that, that. You brought the brought, brought the children a toy. I remember that one was a steamroller. I can't remember what the other thing. Oh. Was. <laughs> well, I know the kids were sick. That's for sure. Yeah, so you was were. I. You were. Yeah, yeah. we all were. Yeah. You were. You're a little green, to say the least. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but your cabin was at the optimum position in the boat to make you sick. Actually. Oh, it was really rough. It was, it was terrible. Yeah, we could, um, you could sit on the rear deck of the boat and uh, the, it was rough enough that the uh, uh, screws, with the propellers would come right out of the water and flump it. And the horizon would disappear for, uh, it seemed to be an endless length of time. I don't, I don't think I ever went out of the cabin. <laughs> and the other interesting thing is when we, we came up from Port Hope, the, the, and that was the 19th of October? Yeah. That's, that's correct. The shoulders were completely white and covered with snow. So if you were worried about the past winter as being bad, uh, the 50s, there was a lot of snow, believe me, and it never left that winter. And at the same time, there was a, a, the same date, there was a ring of ice all the way around Clear Lake. So it was starting to freeze up on the 19th of October. And you had asked me on the train up, you came along and asked me when we got snow over here. Yeah. And I said, well, usually in November. <laughs> and when you saw the snow, you said you thought you told me November. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, there was lots of snow at that time, and uh, I know I, I I boarded on Chippewa Avenue, and the snow banks were you could not see the cars parked on the street. Which year was that? What year? Fifty one. Fifty one. Fifty one. Yeah. October fifty one. Yeah, you brought me away. Right. But you know it's a it's funny how you. You think back on those days, and it, it seemed just a matter of course just to get on the boat and come here. Well, you were told that I was going to be on that boat, but I wasn't told. You arrived at my cabin door by surprise to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that um, the um, oh, what was her name? Did you did, did you recall the name? Wood, something. Wood. Peggy, Peggy, Peggy Wood. Woods. Yeah. Peggy mm -hmm. and Colin Woods. Yeah, they lived up on William Street, didn't they? Yes, that's yeah. correct. Mm -hmm. and I they, remember they, you they, saying you didn't know how you were going to get to Lakeville. And I said, well, yeah, Don was going to rent a, a taxi to bring us. Yeah, so we all got on. Yeah. Came up with it, didn't we? That was an unusual uh, way to meet somebody and just yeah. come to a new country. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> Thank you, Mike. Uh, is there anything else that, that you would like to add to any of anything that we've talked about tonight? We might just give everybody a few minutes to ask you a few questions if they'd like to, in case we've left any gaps in the story. Uh, but anything you'd like to offer first? I never worked after I got out here. Oh, did I, you? I worked, no, but I, I did work at the Bell for three oh, years. Really? In the 50s. Right. In the 50s, I okay. worked. Just for three years. Right. Actually, I think it was two years and ten months. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Now we'll have a bit of a finale, but maybe we'll just take five minutes here and open it up if anybody has any questions for either Muriel or Madge. I'd be very in interested to hear about your reaction on first hearing the steam whistle on a Canadian train and comparing it to the steam whistle that was on your English trains, which you knew well. 
Well, it was a lot louder. <laughs> <laughs> and the trains were so rough. When the first night we were on it, they went in somewhere and shunted. And you just felt like you'd go from one end of the berth to the other. <laughs> <laughs> it was, they started stuff to lot fat, a lot rougher than the English trains. The English trains just come out of the station. You don't know you're moving hard. And they, the ones over here were so rough. <laughs> the reason I asked is that I remember the reverse uh, situation. Five of us went over, landed in Liverpool, we got off the ship and onto the train, and then it blew its little tiny wee whistle, and we burst into laughter. <laughs> there was no woo 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 at all. <laughs> There's another question over here. Madge, did you have anything to say about... No, 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 okay. Is there anybody here that's an American? Is there anybody here that's American? I'm safe to say this. <laughs> <laughs> this is a joke. Maybe I shouldn't have it. The American soldier was standing on the platform beside the... Uh, what you call them, the guy who goes on the train anyway, and uh, his conductor, he said to the conductor, do you know what we do with these things, if we had them, these trains, if we had them in the States? And the Englishman said, well, judging by the way you've been carrying on here, I think you either eat it, drink it, or sleep with it. <laughs> <laughs> your name just so everybody can, we might just record this for our... Susan Lash, but I, I come from Fowler's Corner. Yeah, that's okay. We like Fowler's Corner. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Thank, Thank you. Isn't that incredible? Paddle jump, as we call it. It was a little wee tiny boat. Well, it wasn't very big. No, it wasn't big. <laughs> Do you know her, Nora? Are you by any chance Pete's mom? Yeah. Yeah, this is his wife. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> all right, do we have any other questions at all or comments? Yes. I'd like to know when Muriel and Matt ran into each other in Lakefield. Oh, yes, your first meeting in Lakefield. Well, Muriel came up to McFadden's to meet me when she heard I was there. Oh. You don't seem to remember. <coughs> oh, I can't. No. Oh, you <laughs> you walked up that road up. You know, yeah. at the back of the house, yeah. to there. And you come up to meet me, and it was a nice, in the morning, it was nice oh, and straight. Yeah. Yeah. But I know, one thing I forgot to say, they had a, a when May Holmes came out, Doug Holmes' wife, did anybody know her? Yeah. 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 When she came out, they had a big uh, village shower for us. We had never had showers in England. <laughs> they had it in the town hall. They told us we were going to a dance. Mm -hmm. And we arrived there. They had every kind of gift you could think of. End tables, pots and pans, wow. and 
cookie sheets, everything you could think of. Okay, but yeah. you said you still have a couple, at least I a couple of the have items. I still potato pots, okay? That's <laughs> with the hand over the top. Oh, that's great. I guess the living me, I wasn't in bed. No. <laughs> 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 the hype hadn't worn off. I forgot you. That's it. Anyway, so yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> yes, I have one for Matt. Did, did you ever meet... Uh, Tucky, a uh, Bernard Big fan, or? No, I never met him. Uh, he came over and he wrote and said he was coming to visit me when he got his leave. But he didn't get a leave, no. they sent him right to Tucky. Black France. And he was killed the yeah. night he went there. I, I talked to him at the Lakefield Post Office, his brother, my brother, and, yeah. and they were very good friends. I was yeah. quite young, but uh, we had a chat and I know he was killed within three weeks. Yeah. Yeah, he was killed the day after he went to the front, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What did your parents say when you told them you were going to marry a wild colonial boy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess they would try to talk you out of it, but couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Mine didn't try to talk me out of it. They really liked Don. <laughs> well, mine's did because I was so young, so they right. didn't try to yes. talk me out of it. Yeah. Yes. I was old. I was old, was old yeah. enough to know my own mind. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Okay. People have been thinking about it, but I just like if we're ready to close and no one has any other questions, I just want to point out that both of these ladies are musical in their own right. We've mentioned that that Madge is, has been a singer, is a beautiful singer. I'm not going to ask you to sing. Oh, I can sing. <laughs> <laughs> You're giving me that evil eye. <laughs> and Muriel loves to dance and has always loved to dance. And uh, just to, kind of in, in honor of the two of them, we have Tom King here tonight, uh, kind of in celebration of these two extraordinary women that we've invited to be with us tonight who chose Lakefield over 60 years ago. And from who, from that time on, you've graced us all here in Lakefield with your, because of your courage, I guess, uh, with your adventuresome spirits, your beautiful families, and these stories of love and adventure and settling here in Lakefield. We're so happy to have you, have you here tonight. So in honor of you, um, we're going to have Tom King play the anniversary waltz. And if everybody could just tell me how you feel about this, would you like to see Muriel and her daughter Pam? Dance a Viennese waltz. I'd like to tell everybody about uh, Muriel and uh, Dawn and Gail and my connection. Uh, in 1980, we moved up from uh, Prospect Street. To Chippewa Avenue, directly across the road was Don and this lady. And uh, right from the start, we had a great understanding. We got along famously. She uh, she didn't bother my dog, and, and my dog never bothered her cats. So, <laughs> I just thought I'd pass that. Yes, we did. Yeah, we have one called Misty. Yeah. And I would, I would have one day and I'd call it Misty, Misty. And this black and white cat came in and I shut the door and I looked down and that's not Misty. <laughs> Are you girls ready to go? If anyone would like to join in, right ahead. Put their shoes on. <laughs>
Thank you for coming. mentioned that I am the daughter of a war bride and uh, a flying officer of the RCAF. And it certainly wasn't the adventures that Madge and Muriel had, but my father was a, a Spitfire pilot, and as he was training to fly the Spitfire before he went to England. He was training in Newfoundland and my mother uh, was a nurse, flying officer, nurse, um, from near Ottawa. And she had been sent from Brazil where she had become a private nurse to the ambassador to Brazil. She had graduated from Ottawa Civic but when the war started, she didn't want to go back to Brayside of 400 people near Ottawa. So she headed off to Newfoundland and started up a, a, a hospital there. And that's when flying officer Robert Bobby McCracken from Lakefield landed in and uh, certainly created a stir. And uh, he uh, became engaged to my mother and then he went over to England and flew Spitfires and had dogfights and uh, was shot down just three months before the war ended and was in a prisoner of war camp in, um, in uh, just north of Berlin. Uh, in between, it was a prisoner of war camp that they did the, um, the movie The Great Escape. And also I have a book here called The Cradle Crew, which uh, I found at the War Museum and when I opened the book, the front, in the middle of the book is a sketch of the uh, prisoner of war camp and this particular hut. And when you look at the hut, it uh, has the names of all the beds uh, of the people in that hut. And there's Bobby McCracken's uh, name because he was in that particular hut. But um, uh, if you knew Bobby McCracken, <laughs> sometimes he, he loved to tell stories. So that um, when he was released from the prisoner of war camp in May and he arrived back in Montreal on June the 12th and married my mother. My mother had never heard of Lakefield, but when she arrived from having always lived in the north, uh, near Ottawa, she expected to find out that the McCrackens were millionaires. <laughs> I wonder where she got those stories from. But uh, I have a newspaper clipping here where it says, uh, War Prisoner Weds, recently returned from service overseas, flying officer Bob McCracken of Lakefield and his bride and nursing sister with the RCAF are spending their honeymoon at Little Shemong Lake. Flying officer McCracken was a Spitfire pilot and also a prisoner of war, married his bride in Montreal. She is the former nursing sister Myrtle Eileen Armstrong, uh, RCAF. 
and flying officer McCracken's parents lived in Lakefield. So when they arrived, my mother, who was a career nurse, never um, graced a kitchen, so I think she did learn how to boil water, but um, they lived also with um, uh, my father's parents. My grandmother was a wonderful cook, but um, I guess my mother didn't even bother trying to impress her. <laughs> and uh, they lived actually where the treasure chest is now. So half of it belonged to my parents and half my, my grandparents. And I do remember when I was born, uh, I was probably one of the, uh, right after, they, they were married um, in June of 1945. And I am one of the early baby boomers of May 1946. <laughs> so um, I do remember when uh, there was the outhouse at the back uh, of the treasure chest that's got pictures of me going through the snowdrifts. But I just thought I would like to read uh, just because the celebrations of you people coming over and the war was ended and it was a new life. I had read part of this letter before, but it just gives you the feeling about how you must have felt when your husbands knew the war was over and you were going to start a new life. This was a letter that was dated um, May the 17th, 1945, just after the war had ended and my father was released as a prisoner of war in Germany. And this letter was written to my grandmother from an English family in Kent. And when my father was in the um, squadron um, and setting off from Dover, they would, uh, during leave, go to some of their friends' homes. So he became sort of the adopted son of this family in Kent. And it just makes me think of how all of you must have just felt to be a, a couple again and, and a family and the war was over. So this, this was written just after my father was released and it, it's written from this family in England and it's sent to my grandmother. May 17, 1945, Kent, England. My dear Mrs. McCracken, I feel that I must just write a line to say how happy I am to know that my Bobby is safely back in this country. Do you know I went with my husband down to our club last Friday evening and there was a British Air Force boy there who had come from a prisoner camp and had met a friend of Bob's. Well, amongst other messages that he sent me, he said he, that he had made a special call to Bob's squadron on the phone, and they had told him that there was now little or no hope that Bob was alive. Well, I expect you can imagine how I felt. I just walked home in a trance, feeling that nothing else mattered, and just could not sleep all night. And then all Saturday, I could think of nothing else. Then on Sunday morning, about 11 a.m., the phone bell rang, and my daughter Audrey answered it, and I happened to be sitting in the room. I saw her face go very red, and she just shouted, Bob! I could not think for a moment whoever it could be. As you can imagine, the last person I thought of was your dear son, Bob, Mrs. McCracken. Well, then she turned around to me and absolutely yelled, It's Bob! Our Bob! He's safe, and he's in England! He landed a quarter of an hour ago. Well, do you know, I just could not move from the chair. My legs just refused to function. And when I did get to the phone, well, silly thing that I am, I just cried. I think I can safely say that was the happiest moment of my life. And I am sure my husband and two girls would say the same. It was just unbelievable. I still cannot realize it, although he has phoned us and we have talked to him six or seven times. He's coming to see us tomorrow for two weeks leave and then I think he's heading home to Lakefield. Isn't that just too lovely for you, Mrs. McCracken? Although I just dread saying goodbye to him and uh, all of, of uh, the fun times that we had. I do hope that you get him in time for Mother's Day. We do not celebrate that here, but on this special time, I am going to celebrate. 
And so it says, um, I do know that as a mother, you will be so happy that he's coming back. And uh, please keep in touch. And then two days later, my father or my grandmother wrote to my father, who was still in England, because she received a call from these people in England. And in the letter, she my father was very upset about one thing when he spoke to her, that when he was in the prisoner of war camp, they had taken away his signet ring that Grandma had given to him as a little boy, and he wore that always with his signature. And this is what um, Grandma said uh, to him. Um, mind, never mind your ring or watch, dear boy. They're making those kinds of things every day, but they're not making men like you. Not in my eyes anyways. So I thought, well, that was pretty special. So it, it just brings it all to light. And I'm still looking for those millionaire McCrackens that my father said <laughs> were. But I could just feel the joy that you people must have had as a family and the war over. And I, I know that there were other um, women that came to Lightfield um, new, but just from this area. But what a journey you had. And again, thank you so much. We have um, refreshments here. We have pictures for you to look at. If you would like to uh, purchase a book as a gift, or if you would like to put your name beside one of the volunteer uh, sections for next year, or think of somebody that would like to join um, our group, uh, memberships will be renewed uh, starting um, in May again. So thank you for coming, and the evening's not over yet. Just enjoy.